Good afternoon and welcome to uh, the first of the John Jay College Office for the Advancement of Research's Spring Book Talks. Uh, each semester, the Office for the Advancement of Research sponsors at least two book talks, one uh, featuring a John Jay faculty member who's recently published a book, and the other featuring an external scholar, journalist, or uh, other storyteller who we uh, want to expose our faculty and students to. And in this case, uh, we are doing the latter. Today's featured author is Mike Power. Mike is the author of Drugs 2.0, The Web Revolution That's Changing How the World Gets High. Um, Mike is a freelance investigative journalist for British newspapers and organizations, including The Guardian, The Mail on Sunday, Reuters, Matter, The Sunday Herald, Drug Scope, and The Big Issue. He worked as a freelance correspondent in Latin America and the Caribbean, particularly Colombia, exploring the links between civil conflict, human rights, and the drug trade. Uh, Mike's book, Drugs 2.0, is a groundbreaking exploration of the ways in which the internet is changing the development, distribution, and consumption of drugs. It's published by Portobello in the UK, and that uh, version is available in the US through Amazon.com and other vendors. Uh, but the American edition, the expanded and updated American edition, will be published by St. Martin's Press later this year, October. Uh, and that will be available through those outlets as well. The book documents the emergence of legal highs, and it was the first book to investigate the Silk Road, which is the billion dollar online drug bazaar which was closed in October 2013. So welcome, and uh, please give a hearty round of applause to our guest, Mike Powell. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, and welcome to this, this talk. Uh, the title of the talk is the same in my book, that's Drugs 2.0. Um, I started writing this book about five years ago. Um, I was, I was at the time, I was living in, in Colombia, in, in Latin America, and I was, I was looking into the, I'll just get my microphone in a good spot and let you guys can sit down as well. Okay? So I should actually, uh, I should let you know at this point that we have a situation where my finger is the, the clicker for, for the slides. So I will actually be giving a click like this each time I want to go forward and back. So, this is the book, Drugs 2.0. Um, it's a, it was the first book to cover the emergence of legal highs. These are drugs which scare the law uh, by chemical manipulation. It was the first book to cover the dark web, the Silk Road, and Bitcoin. So, really, the reason I started to write this book was because I noticed that drug culture in about 2009 was changing. And by culture here, I mean three things. Um, the way that people were acquiring drugs, the kind of drugs they were buying, and the industry. So all of these things were changing, and technology seemed very connected with this. So 25 years ago, when I was in university, which is a terrible admission, 25 years ago, there was only really four drugs anyone did. They were ecstasy, cannabis, amphetamines, and LSD. Cocaine was kind of a rock star's drug. Heroin was kind of associated with inner city deprivation. That didn't apply to us. So at that time, the, the drug market was kind of limited, and there wasn't really very many drugs, uh, very many drugs available. Um, so after university, I was working in Latin America, and whilst in Latin America, I became interested in the drug store. Um, Daniel. Uh, Dan. Okay. So I was working in Colombia, and I became interested in the civil conflict. I was covering a series of war crimes. The Colombian government was killing young civilians and dressing them in guerrilla uniforms and claiming that they were FARC guerrillas. They were guerrillas killed in combat, but they weren't. They were innocent young people, much like yourselves. So it seemed to me that there was a story to be investigated. And uh, the more I investigated it, I looked into this story and I found that the this is, this is people protesting in Bogota against the government killings, um, the government killings of the young innocent civilians. Um, as I was there, I decided that I could only understand the civil conflict by understanding the drug story. The, the Colombian drug story was very important at that point. Um, at the time, Colombia was exporting 600 tons of cocaine a year. So that's 600 tons, that was 60% of the, of the global supply. And both the FARC guerrilla and the, the paramilitary armed groups, they were funding their fight with the, 
cocaine industry. So I thought I should visit a cocaine plantation. So at the time, the United Nations was trying to, to, to destroy the cocaine industry by uprooting the plants. And the next uh, three slides show that. So off we are going through the jungle. And here's a coca plantation. This is cocaine. Um, at the back is the place where the cocaine is processed. And so as we go to this plantation, uh, we start to uproot the cocaine. This is the United Nations attempt to shut down the cocaine industry. So there we are. There's a guy. He was extremely careful to keep me in his view all day. The next one uh, shows people actually uprooting the coca. And as we did this, I walked into the next field, and there was a guy. This guy, Jose, a cocalero. And I said to him, what will you do now that we've destroyed your livelihood, we've destroyed your field, what will, what will you do? And he said, well, I'll go into the next field. As soon as they go, I'll be planting more coca in the next field. And I said, well, tell me why. He said, well, this bush grows back in nine months and it produces leaves every 60 days. Rice sells $25 a hundred weight. It takes five months of hard work and then needs to transport it by river. Coca paste goes for $1,500 a kilo and the plant needs no attention. And he asked me, what would you do? And I ask you, what would you do if you could increase your salary by a factor of 60 tomorrow? What would you do? So I realized at that point that by artificially inflating the price of cocaine, or rather coca, to such an inflated level, that it was, you know, we were not, there was no chance of ending the, 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 the sort of cocaine industry by pulling up the, the plants by the roots. It was, it, was, it was ineffective. And so at that point, I decided that I wanted to look into the drug story more deeply. And back in the UK, I started to investigate the ecstasy trade. Now, ecstasy is still very popular in the UK. It's used by half a million people a weekend. But in about 2008, 2009, there was absolutely no MDMA. There was no ecstasy in the UK. Um, I started to look into this and wanted to know why. I was finding that at the same time as the, kind of the, the cocaine industry was inexplicable to me, this was also inexplicable. What was happening? in the UK in 2008, that there was no MDMA available on the streets. And so I started to investigate them. I'm a journalist after all. So I looked back into the history of MDMA, and there's Alexander Shulgin, the man who resynthesized it in the 1960s. He was a, a, an American chemist. He's still alive. Uh, he made the drugs, and then he, he actually sampled them and tasted them himself, recorded his experiences. And one of the drugs that he created was, or rather recreated, was MDMA, ecstasy. Now, ecstasy, here's his first ever um, hand-drawn kind of recipe for this, for this drug. This is the, the first modern-day synthesis of, of MDMA. Now, that's right, that's right. So, I looked into it, and in, in this notebook you can see, if you go to the next shot, you'll see how this drug is made in the modern era, or rather, where the base materials for it come from. This is a distillery of saffron. Um, if we go through maybe the next three slides, we'll see. This is in Cambodia. What you can see here is a, in the next one, what you can see here is a distillery. So, saffron is an essential oil. This is the oil which is made into MDMA, or ecstasy, or molly, as it's called in the US. Saffron is on the international watch precursor list. You can't buy it unless you go to Phnom Penh, then you can buy an awful lot of it from these guys. Um, you make it by stripping the, the, the roots from a yellow camphor tree, and then you steam distill it, capture the oil, and you sell the, uh, the, resulting, uh, the resulting oil to Dutch chemists. Now, in 2008, the United Nations, again, had made an attempt to control the global market in saffron and the global market in MDMA, and they burnt all of the saffron they could find. They burnt $7 billion worth of ecstasy oil. Now, this... This, this had an unintended consequence. In the United Kingdom and in Europe, this burning of 33 tons of saffron changed the drug market completely. It changed the drug industry in the UK for a couple of years, almost irrevocably. Um, what happened there, what, how it changed, that oil would have been sent to laboratories in, uh, in Holland. This is one in just outside Belgium. And this is where the drug is produced in clandestine laboratories. It would have been sent to places like this, which is a, a mobile MDMA laboratory to make the drug. So this is, this is the kind of 
the kind of resourcefulness that the Dutch chemists have. Um, so really, at this point, there was also uh, there, there was a huge MDMA drought. There was no MDMA in the UK. So you have half a million people in the UK alone who can't get their drug of choice. Um, another shortage at that time in the UK was of marijuana. Um, Vietnamese gangs in the United Kingdom discovered that by spraying glass beads onto marijuana that they grow, the Vietnamese uh, criminal community in the United Kingdom control the hydroponic indoor marijuana uh, sector. They started to spray marijuana with glass beads, which were invisible and kind of, but just very slightly heavy and slightly visible, and they kind of made it look like very high quality glistening marijuana. However, it was very harmful to the lungs. And so people started to get fed up of it, and this stuff, the, the spice uh, drug came to the market, which was uh, a legal high, a version of, uh, a, version of a, a chemical invented for, for medical purposes, repurposed for the illegal drugs trade, uh, semi-legal drugs trade, rather. So you have this situation where you have no MDMA in the United Kingdom, and cocaine at the time became very, very impure. The cocaine was impure because, well, there'd been the credit crunch. So with the collapse of the fi international financial system, the pound value had also dropped by 25%. Now, to buy cocaine, you need pounds or you need dollars. So if you want to buy dollars, well, suddenly everything was 25% more expensive. So the cocaine uh, quality in the UK plummeted. The ecstasy was non-existent. And so into the market stepped the new drug. And the drug was called methadrone. Now, methadrone was a drug which, according to users, felt very similar to MDMA, ecstasy, or cocaine. It was a stimulant, it was a euphoric intactogen, and it helped, well, it helped a lot of Chinese people make an awful lot of money because the drug was made in China, as you can see in this laboratory. Um, we managed to, I was doing an undercover investigation at the time for a newspaper, and we managed to get into the laboratory, and we met the owner, and he showed us his, his facilities. And at this time in the UK, it was, you know, it was, a very, it was a, very, uh, a very unusual time in the drug market where normally in the years preceding the, the rise of methadrone, methadrone came to the market and it was suddenly the most, well, the fourth most popular drug in the UK within a couple, just within a couple of years. But it was legal, this is the key thing, it was a legal drug and it was sold on the internet for about £10 a gram. That compares to £100 a gram for quality cocaine or £50 a gram for MDMA. So you had a situation at the time where you, you, you couldn't buy cocaine or ecstasy of any quality, but you could buy a legal high. You could buy this drug. And the government had no idea what to do. They had no way legitimately, or rather legislatively, how to handle this. And to give you some numbers uh, around that period, um, in 2009, 24 new drugs came to the market. And then in 2010, when methadrone was ultimately banned, uh, we had 41 new drugs come to the market. In 2011, there were 49 new drugs. In 2012, we had 73 new drugs. And then by October of 2013, there were 56 new drugs registered for sale in Europe. That makes 243 drugs. Um, if you think about that in relation to the United Nations Single Convention on Psychotropic Substances, the United Nations International Global Ruling Treaty only bans 233. So we have more legal drugs for sale than we have illegal drugs. And so this story fascinated me, and I thought I should pursue it. Um, these companies very quickly, uh, they very quickly diversified. Um, if we can go through the next two slides. They diversified and started to make new drugs. And at that point, I thought that perhaps I should test my own hypothesis. And I thought that as well as writing about it, I should actually try to see if what I was writing about was true. And so I, I invented a new drug, uh, a completely new drug. Uh, that was a legal drug, it would be legal, it would probably be illegal in the United States, but in the United Kingdom, it was completely legal. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to explore and to kind of, I wanted to look back, I could see the drug culture was changing. So I thought, when was the first time that drugs and culture became entwined? And to me, that seemed to be when the Beatles uh, first came to prominence. Now I'm from Liverpool, if you're trying to place my accent, um, and so the Beatles. So it was an, an interesting story for me. If you think about it, drug culture only really became kind of popularized and in the mainstream view around about the 1960s, the mid-60s. 
when the Beatles first took, well, they took LSD, but they took another drug before that. And this is in 1962, and then they go off to Hamburg to, to, to play uh, in the Star Club. And here they are, a year later. The Beatles in this photograph are holding tubes of a drug called the Prelidin. Now, Prelidin was a, a diet pill. It was a diet pill that was used by many people, you know? It was used by all sorts of people, but from Truman Capote to, you know, Marilyn Monroe, even JFK used it, apparently. And if you look at the, the kind of the user base of all of those kind of drugs, I mean, in the United Kingdom in 1962, there were two million prescriptions for pep pills. Now, before we kind of look at that with askance, let's look at the statistics for, say, Adderall in the United States. The United States in 2010, which is the latest figures I could get, prescribed 84 tons of Adderall. Now, Adderall is just an amphetamine. That's a drug active at 20 milligrams. But, you know, 84 tons of it were prescribed to the United States. It's not really prescribed in the UK or in much of Europe. So, I decided that it would be uh, an interesting, uh, an interesting and diverting way to explore the change in the drug market and to explore the change in the, in the way that the drugs are being brought into the United Kingdom of Europe by doing it myself for a feature. So this is the chemical structure of phenmetrazine. And in my investigations and through the writing of uh, Drugs 2.0, I, I came across uh, a guy who I refer to in this instance as Captain Beefheart. He is an online entity who has instructed me and told me how to make the drug legal. So I wanted to make a drug that would be legal and still be active as a stimulant. And I wanted to do this to prove that this was possible and to prove how the drug market has changed. So I'm going to go through the next three slides very quickly. One, two, three. And the next one. And we'll stop there. The last three slides were the laboratory that made this drug for me. They synthesized it for me. It took, I, I, I kind of, I wanted to, to set it up in the most implausible way. So I contacted the company and I told them, that I wanted to make a medicine for dogs. You know? I said, I'm a, I'm a veterinary surgeon, I want to make a medicine for dogs, and I want you to send it to me in the UK. Now, this was obviously a lie, because phenmetrazine is a very famous stimulant. But the guy in the factory didn't really seem to mind, and he, he decided to send it to me. Now, he sent it across, um, and here it is, a bag of five grams of white powder. Now, I didn't know what that was, so there was only one thing for it. I had to test it, but not in the way that you might imagine. I tested it using uh, laboratory, so if we can go to the next shot. And the drug, in fact, had actually worked, and it was the correct drug. We, we were there, sorry, back on. So at the time, I was thinking of the, which drugs I was going to modify, and I decided on phenmetrazine, but I could have decided on LSD. That was, in fact, one of the most famous drugs the Beatles ever took. Um, but fact being stranger than fiction, while I was writing this story, the legal highs market in the UK came out with these two drugs, this one and the next one. These are legal versions of LSD sold on the internet to anybody with a credit card of any age, any time, any place, anywhere. You can buy these drugs, you can buy them on your phone, they're delivered to your house, and the police can't stop you. Now, I don't say that in celebration. I don't say that in, uh, I'm, I'm not gloating or happy about that. It's just a description, this is a, a documentary of what's happening in the drugs market and how it affects criminal law, criminal justice, um, harm reduction, how it affects rehabilitation, how it affects people's pleasure. All of these different things are connected in the drug market. And so we can even bring this closer to home and bring it into the United States. In the last few months, we've had the kind of Molly, MDMA, ecstasy, call it what you will, it's all the same thing, has grown to prominence in the United States. Now, that's what you think, but actually what my research has shown, if we can go to the next slide, Let's look at the difference between those two molecules. On the left, we have MDMA, and on the right, we have another drug called methylone. The only difference is that methylone, until April last year, was completely legal in the US, or nearly legal, semi-legal, in the gray area. MDMA, completely illegal. Now, you can buy methylone by the ton from China. You can buy it by the kilo from China for two, three thousand dollars, and then you can sell it as MDMA in the US. $50,000. What's important about that is that the two drugs have a slightly different effect. The drug on the right 
is a harsher drug, it makes your heart beat, it makes you sweat, it makes you, puts you in you know, a stimulated and agitated state. And what my research has shown is that um, a good deal of the MDMA or Molly in the, in the US is actually sold. It's actually methanol. It's been sold under false pretenses. That is about 50 grams of methanol. And that is a couple of grams of MDMA. If you can go back one, can you see the difference between them? I'm not sure you could in a nightclub. I'm not sure you could in a bag, at a party, or anything. So this is what's going on. And then the 10th of April last year, that drug was banned. But then the Chinese laboratories, they just very quickly came out with a new drug, dimethyl. Same drug, very slightly different. So what we have is this situation where we are serially banning drugs. And each time we ban a drug, a new one takes its place. It replaces, is replaced. So that's the kind of legal high story, and that's that part of my book. So as I was writing it, I was investigating into the, the, mar the marketing online drug dealing. And interestingly enough, I found that the very first thing ever bought and sold on the internet, the very primal act of e-commerce, the first thing that a human being ever bought or sold each other online was actually a bag of marijuana. So there's really not that much new under the sun. The very first thing, it was back in 1971, when students from MIT and Stanford connected across ARPANET and they sold, the, they sold each other drugs. It was the first thing they wanted to do. There's something about the internet that makes drug dealing easy and it makes it quite attractive for people. So as the story continued, I was the first uh, journalist to write about the Silk Road. Now there's the Silk Road back in, I think, that was back in 2012. And you can see on there the, the prices of the drugs. The Silk Road is a, a dark web uh, website. It's hidden. It's a hidden service on uh, an anonymous network on the internet. This site was created by very, very skilled coders who were ideologically opposed to the, the market, to, to, uh, to prohibition of, of recreational drugs. And you can see on there that the prices are in, not in dollars, but in bitcoins. And it's interesting, if you look at the prices of things there, there's like 10 bitcoins. Today, that 10 Bitcoin price would actually be $4,000. The price of Bitcoins has actually increased by a factor of about 400 in, in the space of a year. So the Silk Road was a, a kind of an experiment in selling, Ill, selling legal and illegal drugs across the internet anonymously using the anonymous cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. So let's see the next slide. And there's a listing. There's an ounce of MDA. And at that time, that was being sold for a couple of hundred dollars. You could buy it. You could have it delivered to your house. Um, of course, it was illegal. But you could do that without much real danger of, uh, of being captured. So this seemed to me to be an evolution of the online drugs market from the very early days and then through the kind of the legal highs. This seemed to be the next sort of generation. This was the evolution. And obviously, it didn't last very long. And in, uh, in when was it? It was October the 2nd last year. The site was closed and the owner was captured and jailed. Um, it's a, a longer story that, than we have time for today and if you want to find out about it, you can, you can read it in my book. So, again, what, what kind of tickled me, what, what amused me was that a month later, the site was back online and the site is still online. This is from this morning. So I logged on this morning onto the Silk Road, and if I wanted, I could have bought 200 milligrams of DMT, the world's most powerful psychedelic, a gram of pure flake cocaine for $108, or I could get some Peruvian if I fancy the change for $99. So we have a situation where, as each, you know, as each attempt to kind of change the, the, the to, to shut down the, the drug market and to, to stop people from buying and selling drugs, there's always a new way to do so. Um, but I think it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting to look at the effect that stories and journalism like mine have. And it's quite counterintuitive. So here we have a Google Trends uh, graph from March 2010. Now, in March 2010, there were four stories in the press on this day, on this particular day. You can't see the date in this, in this graph. On this day in 2010, two young people died in the UK. So they died from taking methadone. And the internet response was that vertiginous climb in search queries, not for 
methadrone death or methadrone safety, but for bimethadrone. So on the day that the news reports were coming in that people were dying from the new legal highs, people were after buying them, people wanted to buy them. So as educators and as journalists and as storytellers, I think that we need to be, we need to be mindful of that. And so let's look again at the next graph. Here we have the Silk Road URL. In October 2013, on the day that the site was closed, search traffic climbed to that high point, massively high point. So in, an in, in a kind of internet era, in a connected age, everything we do is, it kind of it influences each other and it pulls and pushes in one direction or the other. So these are the kind of, these are the, these are the ramifications of the, of the web revolution that is actually it's only, it's only really been going on, I think, for about three or four years, but I think it will continue to grow. And I think we need to kind of ask, what does this mean? What, what's the impact of this? I mean, this is the description. We have the rise of legal highs. We have the rise of dark web drug markets. What, you know, what are the impact of these things? And I think it's good to kind of look back. And if you want to look back to one of the first times when, when drugs really were kind of taken en masse, let's look at Woodstock. In 1969 in Woodstock, there were half a million people. There were half a million people, and they were taking drugs, but only two people died. One person from a heroin overdose, and one person from a tractor accident. So let's go forward in, in time to 2013. And in 2013, a guy called Jonathan Graham, an IT manager from Chelmsford, England, he was at the Brownstock Festival in South Woodham Ferries, a tiny little hamlet. There were just 5,000 people present. And he uh, his, his post-mortem, he was sold a drug at that festival called 5-EAPB, a legal drug, a legal alternative to a drug which had been banned just three months before, a drug called 6-APB. These drugs all have kind of chemical formula names. And so this is the kind of, this is the, this is the impact of it. What I've noticed what's happening is that each time we ban a drug, something new comes on the market and it's, it's often more toxic. And I want to know, you know, if we as kind of experts, analysts and advisors and academics think that is that the way that we should be driving policy? Every time we make an attempt to change the, the drug scene for the better, it very often becomes worse. And so I think really to conclude, what I would say in conclusion is that as we kind of, as we go along in this, in this kind of century of prohibition. Every time that we've tried to bring a new drug law in, every time that any drug laws existed in, in kind of any meaningful way, a clear pattern has emerged. As each law to prevent drug consumption is made, a means to circumvent that law is sought and it's found. And those means can be chemical, they can be legal, they can be social or technological. And we stand today at a crossroads formed by those four elements with the web making possible communication between distant strangers and it facilitates the sharing of limitless quantities of information and it enables the distribution of drugs anywhere in the world. So where do we go next? And when I was preparing this speech, I was thinking about the work of Jock Young, the distinguished professor of criminal justice and sociology here who passed in November, and I'm sure that he would have smiled in recognition at the moral panic that has been created over legal highs and the Silk Road itself. Now these new drugs that I've documented and that I've even created are harmful. All drugs are in some way harmful. In the case of synthetic cannabinoids, they're many times more harmful than cannabis themselves. And so, you know, the synthetic cannabinoids have caused strokes, they've caused deaths, and that's something that cannabis cannot do. If you wanted to kill yourself with cannabis, you would need to eat about 700 kilos of it in 15 minutes. You cannot kill yourself with it. You could, you could beat yourself to death with it, perhaps, but you can't. You can't do that. You can't kill yourself with cannabis, but with these synthetics, you can. So, you know, from the main, the kind of the main message I want you to take away from this is that the drug culture has changed, and it is changing. It's atomized. It's proliferated, and there are now more drugs on sale in more ways at this point in human history than ever before. Now, then, the UK claims that there were 97 deaths from what we call novel psychoactive substances, legal highs, the legal drugs we've been discussing today. The figure was actually 44, that's another story again. That's, but this is just 0.3% of all drug deaths in the UK, so it really isn't time to sound a moral panic about this. 
But it is important to acknowledge that these new synthetic drugs are, in many cases, more harmful than the banned drugs that they actually replace. And they're certainly more than none. And you know, that's the perspective from which they're best seen. I, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, after five years of looking into this, I wouldn't argue for, for legalization. Um, I would say that our laws are currently unworkable. I'd say that they're counterproductive. I'd say that the laws seem to increase harm. They don't seem to reduce them. We've lost sight of our original goals in creating drug policy. We want to surely protect people from harm, addiction, and death. Our laws are not achieving that at the moment. And I don't argue for legalization. I don't even argue for decriminalization right now. I think instead we need experimentation, observation, and regulation. We need to control the market in a truly new and novel way. Because right now, we've outsourced the production, the distribution, the sales and marketing of all drugs to international armed criminal organizations and Chinese pharmaceutical factories. And that seems irrational to me. You know, trying to end the cocaine trade by uprooting individual plants in Colombia or stopping individual consignments or shutting individual distilleries in Cambodia, it just doesn't work. It's counterproductive. And while the law persists, uh, the, uh, the law persists with this irrational economics, it, we're not going to solve it. I mean, I want to know how is cocaine more valuable than gold? Cocaine costs in the UK $1,500 more or less for an ounce of high quality coke. Now, gold yesterday costs $1,346. These are the economics of prohibition, they're irrational. Now, I was working with a, a great physician, a guy called Dr. David Caldicott, a uh, guy in Australia. He's worked with me on analogies, uh, on investigations, and he offered me a, a great analogy. He said, let's see drugs as an illness, and let's see prohibition as an antibiotic. If you treated any illness with the same antibiotic for 50 years, medical people would be stunned if resistance hadn't developed. So instead of that, instead of that prohibition, I would argue that we need a system that experiments with new approaches, one which regulates the production and distribution and the sale of mood altering drugs, and one that approaches this, this challenge with a rational, non-moralistic, and a completely fresh mindset. And that really is the work for people with a fresh outlook, people who dare to challenge the status quo, those who dare to think the unthinkable and make other people think it too. In short, it's people with open and inquiring minds, people very much like yourselves.